Welcome to The Economy Magazine. I'm Benjamin Chong Alfares with a roundup of the latest economic reports. Coming up, India reveals new budget and reforms aimed at dazzling investors. First, the headlines. China's central bank announced a surprise rate cut as it seeks increasingly aggressive measures to wrap up activity in the economy. Sunday's rate cut lowered both the benchmark one-year loan rate and the one-year deposit rate by a quarter percentage point. The central bank in a statement said plunging commodity prices globally provided room to spur growth by lowering interest rates. But as China joins other economies in easing monetary policies to curb deflation, the question remains whether Chinese consumers will take advantage of the rate cut amid weak growth. Argentina's embattled President Cristina Fernandez argued in her annual address hers was the only country in the world to have reduced its external debt. Fernandez suggested Argentina had been victorious in its struggle to reduce debt left from its 2001 economic crisis. The opposition in the Congress criticized her for not mentioning Argentina's high inflation and low levels of foreign investment. Fernandez was recently cleared of allegations she protected Hezbollah terrorists involved in a 1994 bombing in exchange for oil and trade benefits from Iran. Ladies and gentlemen, lawmakers, compatriots, we have definitely pulled Argentina out of debt. German utility RWE and a Russian partner said they will proceed with a $5.6 billion deal for oil and gas fields, despite objections by the UK. The deal to sell RWE's oil and gas arm DIA gives Russian billionaire Mikhail Friedman the assets to launch a new international oil company. The company would have fields in Britain, Norway, Denmark and Germany, as well as licenses to work in Algeria, Guyana and Turkmenistan. The deal comes amid heightened concerns about Russian control over European energy supplies. The British North Sea natural gas fields form about 20 percent of the DIA transaction, and the UK government fears Friedman could be a future target of sanctions. Samsung Electronics launched its latest Galaxy S smartphones on Sunday in a bid to reclaim the throne as global smartphone leader from Apple. The new flagship product, Galaxy SX, features a slim body made from aircraft-grade metal. Samsung's previous flagship Galaxy S5 was outsold in the second full month of global sales by Apple's older iPhone 5S, according to researcher CounterPoint. Apple surpassed Samsung as the world's biggest smartphone maker late last year, selling a record 74.5 million iPhones following the success of its big screen iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. Well, as I say, they're two big phone brands, and really uh, it's all about those two brands in the market in terms of size. So we do compare ourselves. You know, we think they're very different brands, they bring different solutions to the market, and in the end that's great, isn't it? Because consumers get a real choice. We have very different offerings, so consumers can choose what they prefer. India is poised to make a big turnaround this year based on a new budget and a slate of reforms aimed at making the country more attractive to investors. And given a new growth target of over 8 percent and a drop in inflation and the current account deficit, the economic landscape is already looking better. Here's more. Narendra Modi came to power in May of 2014 on a wave of election promises to reform and revive the Indian economy. Modi's government has been inching forward on the measures and now presented his government's 2015-2016 budget over the weekend with much of that in mind. The NDA government headed by Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi has undertaken several significant steps to energize the economy. The credibility of the Indian economy has been re-established. The world is predicting that it is India's chance to fly. Indeed, the optimistic budget is focused on growth, not without reason. According to forecasts, India's GDP may hit over 8 percent this fiscal year. Based on the new series, estimated GDP for 14-15 is 7.4 percent. Growth in 2015-16 is expected to be between 8 and 8.5 percent. 
aiming for a double digit rate seems feasible very soon. To achieve this, India is aiming to invest heavily in one of its weakest sectors, infrastructure. $11 billion will go to rail, roads and ports. As well, Modi's controversial government is aiming to lower tax rates to attract foreign investors and establish a social security system. Many experts were surprised at this. Actually, uh, I was thinking that this budget would be very pro-industry, pro-corporate sector. But very surprisingly, the budget has a lot for the common person in India, which is very important. And it has gone into uh, schemes which will actually bring about a welfare system for all, and especially the poor. The state will be spending a lot of money to make these investments and growth targets come to life. The government says it can reach its 4.1 percent fiscal deficit target for the year ending in late March and 3 percent down the road. The central bank, though, continues to worry about the resurgence of inflation. We join now from Bangalore, India, by David Kainan, vice chairman of the Israel-India Chamber of Commerce, for a local perspective on the reaction to the new budget in India. Hi, Mr. Kainan. Thank you for joining us. And no problem. Hey, Benjamin, how are you? Mr. Kainan, good. Some have called this budget surprising, given Modi's focus on the working class and on social services. Is it surprising to people there on the ground where you are? I think that uh, the, the, this budget is not a surprise. If it is, it is slightly positive. So, but uh, ever since Modi has uh, resumed the office, it was clear that uh, one of his key focus areas are going to be the lower classes and the middle classes of India. And this budget is definitely uh, well within that, uh, that focus and, and, and direction. Okay. And another word you used to describe this budget is revolutionary. Is that true? Is this a massively different budget? I could say yes. I could say yes. Uh, this budget has, I would say, three focus areas. Uh, I'll, I'll start from the less revolutionary to the more revolutionary. On the uh, less revolutionary is uh, freeing up um, a lot of internal processes, like registering a company, shutting down a company, uh, all the um, daily, all the daily interaction of the the, the, the company and, and the, and the mm. economy with the uh, with the authorities. It is definitely becoming much simpler, and this is something that everybody were uh, a expecting and and b right. definitely seeing in, in a very uh, positive way. Uh, the second focus is on infrastructure projects, specific on uh, railway, railway uh, power, specifically solar power. And again, you could say that it is a surprise, but it's not a great surprise. The surprise is not the fact that we see focus on solar energy and uh, solar energy and. and and, uh, and railways, the relative surprise is the magnitude, the amount of money and the long-term vision that we see in that budget in, and in the overall uh, five and ten years plan that this uh, government has presented yesterday. The real interesting piece, uh, which, is, which is coming as a surprise, even though uh, Modi was saying that throughout his uh, campaign, is the inclusion of the lower classes into this budget. We see it in uh, a unified mm -hmm. medical insurance for all people. Uh, we see it in uh, multiple schemes for all the people to ensure that uh, they do not, uh, you know, once they they, they are um, out of the working, uh, um, out of the, uh, sorry, working period, they would be, uh, they, they would not lose all of, all of the money and so on. Uh, and thirdly is, of course, the uh, mandatory pension that uh, the government is going to aid take from people, but not less than that, ensure that there couldn't be a situation where someone later on in his life is not going to, um, would not be able to uh, survive on his pension. Right. Well, clearly all groundbreaking reforms. Now, we know that foreign investment in India has had its ups and downs. Can you trace for us the trajectory of foreign investment interest in India? I, I think that the major, um, the, the two parts of the Indian economy which are much more favorable today than what we had a couple of uh, couple of weeks, couple of months back. First, due to this new budget, we're going to see much more investment in infrastructure, which means that all the companies that provide into the infrastructure, into railways, into roads, into airports, uh, into human in infrastructure, uh, could benefit from that growth. And the second one is the 
fact that uh, because of the ease of processes that this budget and future budgets are going to uh, put in place, the interaction with the Indian authorities, which is not easy, I'm here for the last 13 years, so I know, uh, is going to be much, much, much easier. It would be easier to uh, invest easier to retain the money back to to your uh, home in, uh, to your home country and because of that i believe that india is becoming a much more attractive investment destination than it was a couple of couple of months couple of years back right right clearly are interesting reforms but how is that going to impact the growing relationship between israel and india uh, the connection between israel and india has seen steady up, uh, uh, upgrade in the last couple of years. The main focus is still on defense product on the one hand and agriculture uh, product, agriculture uh, product like uh, utilities, like uh, specific deep, deep irrigation on the other hand. We do expect that the defense relationship are going to uh, significantly enhance given uh, Ministry of Defense yeah, loan visit to India just uh, two weeks back and many, many other ge geopolitical political reasons in the industry in other industries and in the tech com and in the uh, tech uh, side we do expect a growth as well just 3 weeks back we were uh, notified about the acquisition of an israeli company named panaya by infosys which is india's largest it company and we expect many of that to come in the near future Okay. Well, thanks, Mr. David Kenan, Vice Chairman of the Israel-India Chamber of Commerce, for giving us a better understanding of the significance of the new Indian budget. Okay. Thank you, Benjamin. It's been my pleasure, and uh, have a great day over there in Tel Aviv. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now we're going to go with Daniel Roth to take a look at media in Media Watch. And we're not just looking at media, we're actually looking at Bernie Sanders, isn't it? Yes, Bernie Sanders. We're looking at Bernie Sanders, who's looking at the media. <laughs> uh, the Huffington Post had this uh, really important piece uh, covering Bernie Sanders, who is a senator from the United States, who is the only socialist sen senator in the Senate, mm -hmm. uh, who was calling out the media for not covering the Trans-Pacific Partnership virtually at all, is what he said. It, it's the biggest trade pact upcoming uh, if it's going to be signed in the history of the United States. It covers 40% of the global economy, right. and almost no one's talking about it. To and our credit, we have talked about it. Yes, we've been talking about <laughs> it here, and uh, apparently Bernie Sanders is not watching I-24 News. This is something we also learned uh, in, yes, <laughs> in, his, uh, in his speech. But, uh, but it's really, it's quite an important pact. He was talking about how there's almost, because there's no coverage, there's almost no criticism of something that he likened to NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, right. which people talk about these pacts as uh, opportunities for growth by lowering uh, tariffs and gaining on investment, bringing in for foreign investors and right. uh, business interest. Uh, what happened with NAFTA is what Sanders and many are afraid will happen mm -hmm. with the TPP, which is that it's going to deregulate the job market. It's going to uh, reward countries with l bad human rights r records because com uh, companies will start to look for deregulated markets to pay people uh, way under what in America would be limited uh, minimum wage. Right. Uh, basically, Sanders and people who are critics of this are saying, actually, in the end, it doesn't lead to growth. It leads to job losses and human rights violations at the right. end of the day. He's looking at it from the human uh, perspective, so to speak, the human interest perspective, whereas a lot of the, the media were as far as they actually cover it, were to look at it from a more economic, cold economic perspective in terms of, of, of growth for companies, so to speak, right. and for countries in general. Right. And one of the things he's mentioning is that companies aren't necessarily interested in growing in America. They're interested in growing in general. Sure. Um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, he's saying nobody's talking about it enough, and that's the that's the bottom line with this piece. Uh, okay. What we else are, do we have here? We have this uh, from Slate. Uh, this really interesting, uh, questionable company called the Corrective Education Company. Uh, this is a company that basically offers their services for free to retailers like Whole Foods, like Burlington Coat Factory, these stores across America, mm -hmm. uh, Bloomingdale's. Right. And basically, if a shoplifter is accused of shoplifting, not even caught red-handed, but accused, a security guard brings them into a back room and offers them a choice. I'll call the police or I'll charge you $320 to take this course from CEC, this company. Right. Uh, now, 
20,000 people have chosen to take the course, but there's a huge question here. Four lawyers, four lawyers were asked to look at this for the Slate article, yeah. and they said, basically, this is coercion. This is bordering on illegal activity because what's happening is people who may be innocent are being told, look, if you don't want to deal with the police, pay this company $320 mm -hmm. and take their course. But if you have nothing to hide, well, Why would you go for the so, course? So one of the notes is that in America, as we've been seeing particularly in the last six months, for primarily people, working class people and people of color, oftentimes it's more worth it to not deal with the police at all because because uh, there's there's very clear biases. I see. Um, so. Okay, well, on that note, Daniel Roth, thanks for joining us for Media Watch. Thank that you. That is the end of our Economy Magazine for today. I'm Benjamin Chalafaris. Thank you for watching. Do join us again tomorrow for more on the economy, and we'll have more on Daniel Roth as well. <laughs>